Now we're going to turn and use WBPP to process a set of monochrome data, that is data that has groups of colored filtered information. And this particular data set, you know, the setup is very similar to some of the other videos I've already demonstrated uh, as far as WBPP is concerned. Uh, however, I'm going to take this opportunity to not only show the setup, the configuration, but also the use of another very nice feature of WBPP, which is the interactive mode of local normalization. So I'll do that uh, with this data set, and I think it'll be a lot of fun. The first thing I'm going to do, though, is create a cosmetic correction template. This particular data set, as I'll show, is a fairly simple one, and a single template is enough. I actually already have a template right here. This is it. It is the one that shows a hot sigma um, using the auto detect method. So if I make another template though, I can make multiple templates, right? One of the interesting things about, let's see, cosmetic core. One of the interesting things about WBPP is that you can actually apply multiple different templates across different groups when you configure WBPP. I don't need to do that in this example. I don't even have an example to show, but if I, at least I have two templates, you can see how in the pull down menu, you can actually choose one or the other. So let's go ahead and look at that. Go to script batch processing and then to weighted batch. Well, I want to call it now the weighted processing pipeline, batch processing pipeline. That's what I want to call this tool. And let me show you the directory that has data. So this data comes from a friend. His name is Joseph, and he has been uh, very kind to provide me with some data. I still have not had a chance to process, uh, but I'm going to use this as a, a great excuse to go ahead and do it. So this is data that comes from his huge 24 inch telescope. And he took data of this kind of obscure little piece of nebulosity in Orion. And uh, because of the way that the timing worked out, it was at the end of one year where Orion was already setting, and then uh, the rest of it was completed on the subsequent year. And it just so happens that in the first year, I believe the color data was taken, and then subsequently the luminance, or vice versa, it doesn't matter. And because the color data is binned two by two, and the luminance is not, there is a natural grouping that has occurred with respect to time, because all of the color data was done in one year and all of the luminance was done in another. So if you look at the calibration files here, you can see it has two different sets of them for one year and the other year, but it just so happens that everything is distinguished by binning anyway, just because of the nature of the fact that all the colors were done, in one, were done on one year and all the luminance files on another. So I'm pointing that out. You'll see why that's interesting when I load this information. I used, let me cancel out of this and just show you, I used the directory button here because I'm going to load everything automatically. Uh, Joseph is an advanced astrophotographer. He, um, everything is really done really well here. And of course, I know that all the files, the file headers are going to be correct and all of that. So I can just use the directory button to load everything here very quickly. And having done that, you can see here we have the binning of the sum of the biases, binned two by two. And then we have another group of biases which are unbinned. And you can see though that it, he put like a designation, I don't know what the B stood for, but he has a B1 and a B2 to distinguish between these two. But it so happens that the binning is already distinguishing them. So I don't need, the point is I don't need to use grouping keywords because nothing needs to be grouped. If I did use a grouping keyword across B1 and B2, it would look the same because they're already grouped by binning. That's the point. So the darks you can see are here. We have flat field images. And then we have the light frames. And within the light frame group, you can see that the color data again is binned two by two and the luminance data is unbinned. So let's go ahead and look at the calibration panel and start setting things up here. You'll see some warning signs. Ignore that. We'll get to the warning signs in just a moment. But let's just look at, for example, the luminance light frame group. This one looks OK because we can see it is matching a dark frame that's of the same time. Uh, sorry, up here. 1200 seconds matches 1200 seconds. We can see that it's using a flat from the flat group that is of the same filter group, same filter name. So that's good. 
and um, the flat field image that it's going to use that, you know, it'll have a master flat that'll be generated. This master flat itself is the combination of calibrated flat field images, which are calibrated in this case by the bias frames up above. You can see that we have uh, bins one by one, bins one by one bias up above. You can see it gets lit up in green and we can see the check mark here. We can also always look at the calibration diagram where it spells it out explicitly. The same is true in this light frame group. We can see that everything makes sense. No problem at all. So one of the interesting things that I wanted to demonstrate is that if you did have multiple templates here for cosmetic correction, we want to set that up. Um, and you can either do individual and different ones across different, I just did apply to all, didn't mean to do that. So you can do different ones across different groups. Let's do that again. Oh, I did apply to all with none. So I can put a CC here, but if I went to this group, I could choose a different one if I wanted to. That's all I wanted to show you. Now, of course, these are actually both the same copies. So if I just now apply to all, I will get it the same uh, template applied across all of the groups. That's how that works. Now, let's get to the warning here. The warning is when I click on one of these light frame groups with the status that has a little warning symbol, what it's telling me is that the light frames exposure differs from the dark frames exposure, which is very true because this is a 1200 second long exposure, whereas the dark frame is 240 seconds in a duration, which is okay. That's fine. Uh, what we can do is we can optimize or scale that dark frame to make it uh, appropriate to subtract from this light frame and calibrate it. So what we do is we just say optimize master dark according to this group so that when it subtracts from this group it will be correct. That's why we have a check mark here and everything is good. You do that for each of the groups that we need that to happen. Now let me make my big caveat. I think people know that I will always say this which is that dark frame optimization requires an extra bit of attentiveness uh, by the user. Now, uh, my friend Joseph is, as I said, an advanced amateur. He knows what he's doing, and uh, he knows the goodness of the data set that he gave me. We know, for example, that this dark frame has significant dark current uh, because this is a regular CCD camera. So the optimization of a 1200 second exposure using a 240 uh, 2400 second dark frame is going to work out well. There's plenty of dark current. The problem happens when you try to do this optimization where there's very small amounts of dark current, where the exposure times are short. And in particular, what you don't want to do, I would just caution against this, is take flat field images and try to calibrate them using optimization of darks um, that are much, much longer in time because there's very, very little dark current here and there might be either small amounts or even if it's a large amount, it won't necessarily work out. So my suggestion is do not calibrate um, your flat field images by using the optimization of a master dark. Instead, either match them with what are dark frames for flat field images or obviously, as I'm doing here, calibrate them with a bias. If you have the, the sensor that allows you to do that, most sensors you can, you would calibrate your flat field images with a bias frame. So this is perfectly legal to do, but we need some attentiveness. We'll need to look at the data and make sure that it, you know, it does actually do as advertised. It calibrates that data. We'll, we'll know if it's not working, if the flats just don't seem to work at all. If we see dust donuts everywhere and vignetting everywhere, we know that this optimization uh, didn't work out properly because it won't allow the, the flats to really do their job very well either. All right, so let's see. We have everything I think I want to set here. This is not a color filter array, so we don't need to worry about that. There isn't a pedestal to worry about here either. Let's just look at the post calibration activity. We do want to do subframe weighting, and I'm going to choose my favorite here, which is the PSF scale SNR. This is the pure signal noise method for weighting images, and that's what I want to do. For image registration, these data, as I say, were taken with a big telescope. So this is not undersampled data. The stars subtend many more than a few pixels. They're oversampled, uh, so not drizzling. 
the automatic settings here for the interpolation method are just fine. So there's nothing to change there. I will mention though one thing before I move on, as far as image registration is concerned, image res uh, registration is tied to this button or this pull down over here, this behavior over here. So the behavior is when I look here at the light frame groups, how are these data going to be registered? When I choose auto, it's going to look across all of these groups and it'll choose the best reference from it. Very likely it's gonna end up choosing one of the luminance data as a best frame. And then it will align all frames to that luminance, to that image. We'll even find out which image it chose. But this does have a consequence. And this is a special case. This data, we have two by two binned data and then we have the one by one. Because I'm using this method, What's going to happen is that it will, in the course of aligning these files to probably one of these luminances, whichever one it picks, it's going to upsample the red, green, and blue data. And that's not a bad thing. That's fine. But there are some cases, and I'll just mention this, there are some cases where you might not want to, for output purposes, output an integrated red, master light red frame that has already been upsampled. For example, you remove the opportunity of using mirror denoise if you did that. Um, and it is possible to use a grouping keyword to allow you to align only all of the RGB data and then align um, the luminance so that you can do more operations on the red and the green and the blue output. And then you can make a color picture which you can align ultimately with the luminance in a second step. So there's another path. I'm not gonna illustrate that path this time, but I just wanna mention that it is available to you um, if it's something that is required. So in this case, as I just to reinforce the idea, we are going to probably find a reference frame in one of these luminance data, and then it'll align all images to it. So I expect to see in my output, one of these red frames are not going to be uh, 2048 by 2048, they will end up being 4096 by 4096 at the end of the day. Okay, so we got the registration taken care of. Now, local normalization. Local normalization has some things that we can adjust here, but probably primarily the most important thing is whether we're going to use a reference that's a single frame or the integration of many frames. And I think that this choice, the integration of the best frames, it's a good default, and it's the one that you're going to want to do if you're using this in an automated way. So by using the interactive mode that I'll show in a moment, we have to intervene. We actually have to supply and uh, a reference frame, whether it is a single frame or multiple frames, we're going to have to select the ones that we want it to use, and then it'll go forward from there. That is actually the way in which it is done when you do it manually, right? You, in, when you do this local normalization in the manual mode, you get that opportunity to determine which frames or frame you're gonna to use to be a reference. And now this feature is enabled within WBPP, but I don't think in general, most people need to worry about it. It's very likely, especially if you're using the integration of the best frames, that you don't need to break the automation, the pipeline, you can just let it flow through and everything should work out well. There are some times where you might need to specify a very particular reference um, for a number of reasons. And so this interactive mode allows you to do it. Uh, one example, one example I'll mention is that if you're going to add data, let's say that I was working on an object one year, and then next year I come back to it, I wanna add more data to it. I don't need to reprocess everything. Um, all I need to do is point at the same local normalization reference that I generated previously, and then I'll be able to normalize all the new data to it. But that means that I'll need a point at it. Um, and that, that can be either uh, the interactive mode where I would specify, but the interactive mode will let me do that. So there we are, that's how you do it. I'm gonna show you the interactive mode in this section. I may not really need it, but it's a great excuse to show how it works. And uh, image integration, the automatic 
selection of a rejection method is just fine in this data set. It may choose a different method for the color data compared to the luminance because there's a different number of files. Uh, for example, for the colors, it'll probably end up choosing the Windsor Eye Sigma clipping, whereas for the, the luminance, it'll end up choosing the GESD. All of that is fine with me. There is one thing I want to do, though, which is kind of, kind of interesting. I would like it to not give me any frames, not, not give me, uh, let's say it differently. I don't want it to integrate to include in the combination any frames that are poorer than a weight of 0.5. That means they have less than half the amount of light of whatever kind of the best frame is in the set. This isn't actually the way this minimum weight was designed to be used. I'm using it kind of as a quality metric here, which is what weighting is about, right? Um, but yeah, I, I want to try to take advantage of this. I have a feeling that none of this data has weights that are that low, but if it did, I don't want those files to be included. That's just going to make my final result, result potentially noisier than it needs to be. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to say, if there's any weights lower than that, just don't even bother to integrate them. And we can figure that out when we see the reports at the end as to how many frames were actually integrated compared to how many we fed in. And that'll tell us if any of those were a lesser quality. And then we can look at them and we can see with our, our eyes and our brains, if, you know, if it really uh, did a smart thing by giving it that weight. And then, of course, I'm saying not including it. But that's it. That's the only thing I'm going to change here. And I think that that should take care of the majority of the setup here. Let's go ahead and look at the post calibration panel. There isn't anything surprising here because I'm not doing any grouping of any sort. We're not changing the exposure tolerance. All the exposures are within their groups. They are the same um, exposure time. And yeah, I mean, there's nothing more to do here. The, and we're not using uh, color images, so there's nothing to debate. So yeah, I think this does set it up. And now I need to give it a directory to save everything too. I'm gonna go ahead and make a new directory here. Call it, just to keep it clean, I'm gonna put everything inside of the results directory. Let's be sure that I, yeah. Put everything in here. And then I'm gonna tell it to go. Run. So as far as the diagnostics is concerned, the only thing we should see here is a warning that I am doing that dark frame optimization, which is fine. And then it tells me how much size is necessary, required space, which is fine. So here's the monitor, execution monitor that we get to monitor. And when we get to this point, you can see it right here in the list where it says LN reference interactive here, here, and here. This is where I need to intervene. This is where it'll require me to be at the computer. Please take note, and this is kind of an important thing, that a normalization occurs across each filtered group of data. If we had a one-shot color camera, it would just be one instance of uh, the uh, local normalization. Unless, of course, we did it per channel, then we have three instances the same. So for each color group, you need to select a reference. So it, normalization occurs within a group of filtered data. So in this case, I need to interact four times. We should see four instances of this interaction here, which is fine. It's no problem. And as I say, it's wonderful to have this feature. It's not super critical. Um, using the automatic method is fine, but it's really good to see how it works. So I'll be back once we get to this point in the processing here.